Good evening. Uh, this is the Warden Avenue traffic calming meeting number one. Uh, at six o'clock, we'll go ahead and get started. On behalf of the city of Ann Arbor, I'd just like to thank you all for joining us. Uh, this is an opportunity to um, engage with the community, engage with residents in the project area for you to get some immediate feedback from the city and, and from us as a consultant. Um, these traffic calming projects rely very heavily on resident feedback. So encourage, I will encourage throughout, but participation will be key in this. Uh, I see we have at least one person online, but it is six o'clock, so I will get started. Others can join in um, as they come about. But uh, quickly, introductions. My name is Christy Fellen. I'll be presenting tonight. Um, I'm joined by JD. Uh, we both work on the traffic calming team for Warden Avenue. We're both uh, with Wade Trim, uh, working as a partnership uh, with the city of Ann Arbor. Wade Trim is an engineering firm based here in Southeast Michigan. We've been contracted by the city to assist with these traffic calming projects. Uh, this includes design work, project management, hosting these public meetings, uh, sending out communications to residents. Uh, so from the Wade Trim side, uh, there's team members, uh, myself, JD, Lori Pollock, Chris Wall. Uh, you might see our, our names or the Wade Trim logo throughout the project, but just, just know that we're working on behalf of the city of Ann Arbor. And naturally with this partnership, we're working closely with the Ann Arbor City staff. Uh, so there are a lot of uh, staff members and different departments that we've been coordinating with uh, throughout this effort. But specifically, we've been working with Andrea, Chris, and, and Cynthia. So this is our meeting agenda for tonight. Most of tonight's time will be dedicated to uh, the meeting one portion under section three, where we will review the devices, present a starter idea, and hopefully collect some feedback from everyone. Uh, but there are a handful of slides just as an introduction that we'll have to get through pretty quickly. Um, as an overview, I, I don't want to assume, but I'm guessing a lot of us are, are somewhat familiar with online meetings. Um, if you're joining from a computer or using the Zoom app on your phone, there are going to be two ways of asking questions and providing feedback. You can either virtually raise and lower your hand using the button at the bottom of your screen. Um, that's just going to let me know that you'd like to speak. And uh, when when it's appropriate, I'll you know let you know that you're able to unmute yourself and, and talk. But if you'd rather type a question or comment out, you can press the Q&A button that's also at the bottom of your screen right next to the raise hand. A chat box is going to pop up. You can type in the text box, press send to submit your message. Um, if you'd like to send the feedback anonymously, just make sure you check the box that's there at the bottom there. And I don't see anyone online who's joining by phone, so I'll skip the instructions for that. Just know that um, if you dial in, there's a, a dial in number if, if you're not able to join through the app. Um, and there's a way for you to raise your hand and virtually raise your hand to speak, uh, but you aren't able to participate in the Q&A. Um, but like I said, I don't see anyone who's joining by phone. Additionally, throughout the presentation. Um, there will be a couple polls that we use through Zoom's polling feature where we're just asking for some feedback on things uh, on the computer, on your phone. When we launch a poll, it should just automatically pop up on your screen. You can answer the polling question, press submit. Uh, once the poll ends, uh, I'll share the results. Those will auto also automatically pop up for you. You can either close them out yourself or, you know, as we're getting ready to move on, I'll also uh, close them out for everyone. And polling is um, 
during the meeting, it is anonymous, uh, but if you're calling in by phone, you can participate in polling, but it is in, it is not anonymous in the way that you'll have to raise your hand, be identified, um, and answer the polling question that way. Just as a test, I'll go ahead and launch our first poll. This is just asking if you live in the project area, uh, this would be a Warden Avenue between Jackson and Dexter. And I'm able to see how many people have answered so I can tell when we have full participation, which we do. So I will end the poll and share the results. You should be able to see that everyone joining tonight uh, is is identifying as a resident of the project area. I'll go ahead and close them and we can move forward. One last housekeeping slide, um, just during the presentation, especially during any kind of feedback from uh, fe fellow community members, you know, your neighbors, just please keep these uh, meeting norms in mind, start on time, end on time, uh, raise your hand to be recognized to talk. We'll only have one speaker at a time. If you are speaking, try to move to a quiet area and silence any background noises uh, while, you're, while you're talking. Make sure you're speaking loud and clear so we can all hear you. I will do my best to make sure that everyone has a chance to speak before we have any repeat speakers. Um, be respectful of other ideas and perspectives, avoid finger pointing, um, try to differentiate between I know and I think or fact and opinion. And then lastly, any inappropriate written and or verbal comment or language, including personal attacks and accusations will result in that attendee being removed from the meeting. So that's the last for housekeeping that I have. I'll pause if there's anything we anyone feels like we need to add or anything I've missed uh, technology wise or just etiquette wise. Also, if speaking loud and clear, that also goes for me. If, if anyone has trouble hearing me, please uh, either raise your hand or use the, the chat and and let me know. But I'm not seeing anything, any activity in the Q&A. So I'll keep moving. So on to the traffic calming process. Um, traffic calming, there's a general definition here for you on the screen. Traffic calming is the combination of mainly physical measures that reduce the negative effects of motor vehicle use, um, alter driver behavior, and overall improve conditions for non-motorized street users. So. Basically the focus in traffic calming is to make changes that will not only make the road safer for drivers, but safer for pedestrians, wheelchair users, bicyclists, et cetera. So um, almost like a complete street type of approach, but calming the traffic, not just for the vehicles, but for everyone in mind. So we've got a lot of examples in Ann Arbor um, some of them will be shown on slides later on, but uh, traffic calming in Ann Arbor, it's a, uh, there's a program that has been created. It's a five-step program. It's designed to provide residents with a formal process for engaging with the city in a partnership um, to perform both a technical analysis of traffic concerns um, on the local streets and also explore potential solutions uh, we do this by using the fundamentals of traffic calming. So like I said, it's a five-step program. Uh, Wade Trim is currently assisting with steps two through a portion of five. Uh, we'll briefly describe each step, but there's a guidebook available online. Um, you also received a very tiny copy of it in the mail with your um, first mailing that had gone out. But there's more detail in there if you want to review anything after the meeting. Um, but very quickly, it starts with 
um, or at least the Mershon Drive, or sorry, Warden Avenue project started with one of your neighbors acting as a petitioner who submitted a request to the traffic calming program for Warden Avenue between Jackson and Dexter. So after defining the project area, uh, the petitioner gathered signatures from other residents who also live in the area. And the requirement for the traffic calming program to accept that request is that at least 50% of that defined project area must support the project and a preliminary, a preliminary technical study must result in at least 10 points. So Warden, uh, Warden Avenue, the project area was able to collect, your petitioner was able to collect signatures from 88% of addresses um, so overwhelming majority of residents are in support of this program. And uh, the preliminary study that was conducted by the city resulted in 28 points. There is a breakdown of those points available on the project website, but this screen just shows some of the, the factors that go into um, assigning points. Uh, so at step two, that's where Wade Trim stepped in. Uh, we sent out mailers with an initial questionnaire to all of the uh, residents within the project area to gather feedback um, on specific concerns you may have with the neighborhood uh, or with Warden. I'm sorry, yeah, Warden. Um, and also what experiences you may have previously had with traffic calming. I apologize, these meetings, the, we start do a couple of these projects, kind of uh, start them at once. So I do several traffic calming meetings throughout the month, kind of back to back. So I apologize, but sometimes I I get tongue tied with the project name. But this is for this is for Warden. Um, so results of that initial questionnaire. Uh, again, it's in detail. Uh, there's a, a detailed summary on the project website, but. Uh, the requirement to continue on to the next step is that at least 50% of those who participate in the questionnaire, not of the entire project area, but of those who participate in the questionnaire must support the project moving forward. So of all the people, I think there were maybe 20 serve questionnaire responses that we had, uh, everyone uh, was in support of it. And um, turn my laser pointer on. This is the project website. You can view the questionnaire summary and other documents um, as we move along through the project on, the, on that website. And very quickly, in general, results of the questionnaire indicated that speeding, um, cut through traffic, sight distances, or visibility were common concerns. Um, there is concern that the Grandview traffic calming has impacted uh, traffic on Warden. Um, we're also noting that common in the common feedback was that uh, there's a lack of crosswalks at the bus stops and um, start on the diagram are some of the important pedestrian crossings. Those are where the existing crosswalks are now. Um, but again, I'll pause here if there's any any other concerns or additional context, context that anyone would like to add. You can use the Q&A, you can raise your hand, um, but I'll, I'll stop here for a moment. And I'm not seeing anything. So keep pushing forward. So step three, that's where we are today. Uh, meeting number one, it's an orientation and a workshop. Um, this is where most of our focus will be for the rest of the meeting. Um, so before I present the starter idea, we'll go through an overview of the device toolbox that's described in the program's guidebook. Um, and another another polling question for you, um, just to see how familiar P 
people may be with the guidebook if, if you've had a chance to, to look at it, if you're familiar with the traffic calming program, um, if you're kind of going into this blind, that's okay. But maybe we can get an idea of where people are at. Okay, so I've got everyone's answer in there. We're pretty mixed. I'm glad that the majority is appreciating a refresher because we kind of have to do it regardless. Um, I'll go ahead and stop sharing. And just quickly before I go into the the device toolbox. Um, because of the structure of this program, the designs that we're able to propose are limited to the device toolbox and the guidebook. Um, so it means if, it, if it's not in the toolbox, if it's not um, in the guidebook, it is not an option for this project. Um, some of the commonly suggested solutions that are not included in this program uh, our stop signs, street closures or cul-de-sac closures, police enforcement, new sidewalk installation, that's a big one, um, and removal of existing devices. If you want additional information on any of these topics, there are some resources that are stated in, the, in that guidebook, um, as well as the A2Gov website. Um, if there are concerns, um, that keep coming up that, you know, just we're forgetting that aren't feasible for this program. I'll potentially just kind of ask you to hold on to those things and we can discuss them at the end of the meeting. But just know that there are things, that these are some of the things that are common concerns when we're talking about traffic calming that just aren't part of this program. Um, but we do have uh, resources that we can point people to. So on pages nine through 12 of the Traffic Calming Guidebook, um, we've basically split devices into two groups, things you drive over and things you drive around. Um, another disclaimer about this portion of the presentation, some of the devices that are in the guidebook, like in that full copy that you can go look at online, I'm not gonna cover them tonight. Um, that's just because they're either not feasible for this specific project um, from an engineering perspective, or they're not feasible because they don't meet requirements set by uh, city stakeholders who provide input at the beginning of this project. So that would be like the fire department, the police department, um, the bus, uh, the bus, the transit authority, the public school um, safety and transit. So they get a chance to look at what we're working with ahead of the meeting. So sometimes there are just things that they don't see are, are feasible. So firstly, things you drive over. Um, these are devices that slow traffic by creating some kind of discomfort if, if traveled at over, if traveled over at a speed uh, greater than 25 miles an hour. So in the toolbox, we have four devices that fall under this category, uh, speed humps, speed tables, raised crosswalks, raised intersections. Um, I will go over speed humps and speed tables. Right now, uh, the raised crosswalk and raised intersection is on pause with the city. So this is these devices are, are currently under review uh, by the engineering department um, just for their ability to, to comply with ADA guidelines or uh, American Disabilities Act guidelines doesn't mean they're completely off the table for future installation. It's just as of right now, they're, it's not something that we're considering for design. So speed humps, this is a, um, you've got a, a diagram on the left and then there's an example of a speed hump. Um, I'm sure there's one that's much, that's a little closer, but this photo is from Wells Street on the right. Um, 
this is just to show you both angles overview to show you that uh, speed humps are typically uh, 12 feet long this way. Uh, at the maximum, they're three inches high. They have a parabolic shape, so they're, they're curved. And then at, at its max, it's three inches high. And they extend the full width of the street, except for the gutter. So you can see here in the photo of the example, um, we're not raising where the gutter is. So it doesn't have impact on drainage. Studies have found benefits of speed hump treatments include uh, speed reduction, traffic volume reduction, crash reduction. Uh, other notes to add regarding speed humps are uh, the height, that three inch height, that's designed for the ease of bike usage and bike safety. Um, I know there are examples around the city that are taller than three inches, uh, but this is the standard that the city is using now, uh, maximum three inch height. Uh, if previously permitted, vehicles can park on speed humps. Uh, so as long as street parking was was permitted before, it'll be permitted after. You can park on a speed hump. This example here shows a, a vehicle parked there. Um, and also trash cans can be can be placed on there uh, if necessary as well. And then we have a speed table, which is just a larger speed hump basically, um, diagram on the left, an example on the right, that's Glenwood Road near Washtenaw. Uh, speed tables, these are raised devices that also, they uh, extend the full width of the street except for the gutter. They're typically 22 feet long uh, and the edges are tapered here. So where you see the chevrons for the flow of traffic, those are tapered. And then the center is flat, usually 10 feet or so center flat platform that's flat. And again, the maximum height is three inches. Uh, so studies have found that the benefits of speed table treatments may include traffic volume reduction and crash reduction. Um, other things to note, speed reduction has been found to be less than using a speed hump. Uh, this platform width, this can be customized uh, that Three inch height, again, that's designed for the ease of bike usage and bike safety. Parking is okay on, on a speed table as long as it was permitted before. Uh, trash cans also can be placed on speed tables if necessary. But probably the biggest takeaway is that um, speed reduction has be, been found to be less than using speed humps. So going through those two um, and some of maybe some of the, the disclaimers before the toolbox, if there's any questions, I can pause here as well. And I've got one from Jacqueline. You can go ahead and unmute if you'd like and, and speak. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you for presenting this. Um, one question I had was, you know, the the fire department is straight around the corner from us and we're a primary cut through for them. When you're working with the fire department, is it their preference that one is better or worse for having their vehicles going over, over those, um, both in terms of how noisy they are going over and how disruptive it is for them being able to move quickly when they need to? Um, they do. Thanks. Thanks, Jacqueline. Uh, they, they do get to take a look at our plans, like our starter idea, our preliminary plan, any changes we make. They do get to take a look at that before, um, before we show it to the public. They do have requirements about clearance, uh, fire hydrant clearance and road width clearance. Um, I have not gotten any pushback on using speed humps versus speed tables. Um, from them as long as they have, they otherwise have full clearance of, of the roadway. So they haven't made any, um, they haven't interjected on, on like, you know, impacts to their equipment on speed humps versus speed tables. The only thing I'll add is they like to make sure 
most of the feedback we've gotten from them is making sure they have enough flat, unobstructed roadway for when they're stopping um, a vehicle, when they're stopping to, you know, park uh, at a site or a location. But they have not, um, they have not given us any preference or um, any feedback on, on just, I, driving over the these devices in general. I'm sure they don't love it, but they know that um, that there is room for compromise. Uh, usually the school buses will tell us they prefer the um, the buses will tell us they prefer speed tables. Um, but again, they, they get a chance to look at these and weigh in if, if they feel like um, there's anything that would be too disruptive to their, their routes. Thank you. You're welcome. And there is a, there's a comment that kind of adds on to that that I can answer. What's the rationale for picking a speed table over a speed hump? Um, if speeding is, if high speeds are not as big of a priority on a street and we have a bus route or like a primary truck route, uh, things like that, we could, uh, we could look at a speed table. Um, but in general, we're looking at speed humps, like when speeding is a factor, when we're trying, when we see a high percentage of people speeding over 25, we're usually going for a speed hump first. And then another question I see, for a street of our size, how many bumps or tables are we looking at? So there is, there are guidelines to uh, spacing these devices. Uh, right now, we're we're just proposing two devices, um, which we'll get to in a in a few slides. But uh, there are general guidelines for how far apart we want to space things. You know, we don't want to pack six speed humps in a you know a, a single block because then it's just it's just some, you're just crawling down the roadway. But we also don't want to space things out too much um, because we don't want to have anyone picking up speed uh, in between those. So speed humps, these race, these kinds of race devices work best when they're used in a series. Um, so like I said, for for this, this project, our, our starter idea has just two devices, um, but there are considerations and guidelines that, that we follow. And then one more question. Uh, any considerations for how plow service for one versus the other during the snowstorm? There is coordination or communication internally with the city to make sure that maintenance is aware of new devices installed. Usually there's more of a concern with curb extensions um, just making sure that those are marked. But the between the two devices, the impact I, I wouldn't say is is any more or less than the other. It just involves some coordination and communication to make sure that uh, maintenance is aware of of new devices on a street. I'm not seeing any more hands raised or comments, so I'll move on to the next section. And this is just the other half of that toolkit, uh, things you drive around. So this other group of devices, uh, things you drive around, this is the type of device that slows traffic by creating a perception of less room for error. Um, perception of the road being uh, visually or physically narrower um, sometimes actually physically narrowing the road. Um, 
So this tool and the device toolbox has seven devices that fall under this category. Um, pedestrian gateways, median islands, pedestrian islands. Unfortunately, um, we're just gonna limit this to curb extensions and chicanes. So um, the devices that have been omitted from this project do, are, are due to street width requirements set by the fire department. So as we were talking before about, you know, what's the, the stakeholder um, feedback in here. The, the main one that we want to be aware of is, is the street width. So a lot of these devices are placed in the middle of the street, um, but that means it doesn't give uh, emergency vehicles enough width to, to move down there if they need to. Um, so curb extensions and chicanes, they are basic, they are the same concept, just in different arrangements. Um, curb extensions, these can be used in several designs, curb bump outs, uh, mid block bump outs and chokers, also chicanes on the next slide that I'll show you. Uh, here on the right is uh, an example of a curb bump out at Granger. So this is where we're extending the, the curb line into the street. Uh, these these are just extensions of the curb line to physically and visually tighten the corridor by narrowing the street width. So you can do two parallel curb bump outs that can create um, a choke point reducing by one or two lanes. Uh, you can alternate them. Here, I'll just show you on the, the next slide. You can alternate them. This is the chicane. Uh, curb extensions, there are a couple things to think about when we're considering them. They may require additional drainage consideration, um, tend to collect debris around the devices, um, which require extra maintenance. But if, if there's not sufficient uh, you know, slope down the roadway or consideration for the, the gutters, it may create um, Drain, it may create drainage concern. Um, it also results in a loss of on-street parking when you use the curb extension. It could take away some on-street parking if there's any there. Um, but you know, if you're using a choker design, a choke design, one or two lanes, um, this could result in speed reduction. It's they've been shown to produce a minor reduction in traffic volume um, when you apply these extensions at the intersection or mid block, that can also shorten pedestrian crossing distances, um, also improve pedestrian visibility and, and help eliminate illegal parking. So here at this intersection bump out, that's it did just that. So it it brought pedestrians out, you know, safely out farther into the street for more visibility. It shortens the distance they have to cross and also it makes sure that there's no one parking too close to the intersection to create additional visibility issues. And then again, this is the slide that shows that uh, alternating bump out to create the chicane effect. And also with these, um, we do have to make sure that we're maintaining 20 feet of road here for emergency vehicles. Um, and making sure that they can safely turn those large um, apparatuses around corners. And then there's one less, uh, one more device that's included in the in the guidebook. Um, this is a neighborhood gateway treatment. Uh, so this is just a physical landmark that's installed to indicate changes from a higher speed roadway to a lower speed, you know, residential or commercial district. Um, neighborhood gateway treatments can increase awareness for, you know, a residential area, residential speeds. Uh, they may require additional right of way when in installing them. And then in addition, uh, the neighborhood or, you know, the adjacent property owner, owner would be bearing uh, the costs of landscaping, installation and maintenance. So again, I'll stop here if there were any more uh, questions or, or if there are any comments on 
on the things that you drive around. And then I've got a raised hand from food gatherers. You can go ahead and unmute if you'd like. Hi, this is Markel. Sorry, I couldn't figure oh, out. Yeah. <laughs> I this isn't really a question about the drive around but I don't know if it fits in the category because we've moved on to the signage I've seen uh -huh. paint, road painting also being used and just didn't know if that if there are any strategies around kind of painting the road to look like it's one lane width and if if there's strategies like that that you also uh, assess thank you okay thanks Markel the so pavement markings or, or paintings those are only used when required with a device. So their signing and pavement markings are only installed if they're required as, as part of the device or the treatment. So um, move back a couple slides. So like the pavement markings, the chevrons, that would be part of, you know, that's part of the installation of a speed table or even you know, more more likely a speed hump. Those are required. There's signing that's also required um, and installed. But outside of that, the traffic calming program does not uh, does not consider any outside. You know, like lane markings, things like that, or uh, um, additional signing. Only what's quite required with the device. Thank you. You're welcome. And then Jacqueline, I see you also have your hand raised again. Go ahead. So much. Um, so on the, like for the bump outs on the north side of our street, um, the sight line is, is um, very limited for oncoming traffic. Um, and so I'm imagining, you know, scooting over to accommodate a bump out where I where commonly people can't see until the last minute that someone's coming over that th that rise. Is there a a specific um, sight line requirement for the bump outs that that would be information that would be available to us to know where those would exist and and whether that would introduce more more difficulty for those of us who are, who are already dealing with that. Um, there is, I mean, there is a, a, there are calculations and standards for sight distance. Um, I couldn't tell you what they are on the off the top of my head, um, but it would be, it would be something that have to would have to be considered uh, if thinking about placing. Uh, you know, any device, a curb extension or, or um, really any device that when there's like a, a safe distance issue already there, like I, I, I drove, I drove through the block a couple times and, you know, I've looked at it through Google Earth. So I'm aware of the, you know, there's the horizontal, like the hills up and down, but there's also like curves side to side. Um, but it wouldn't, I, I couldn't say that there's a, a number I could give you as like a gold standard for checking, but they are things that, you know, we consider when, when we're looking at where we want to place the device or whether or not placing a device somewhere. Did that, did that answer or help? And would you say that that's, that, that you identified that the snow is an issue with the bump out and the markings. And I, I think that's true, like on uh, on the other side of um, Dexter, like wh wherever that is, Urbana, th those streets suffer from that problem um, in okay. the snow. And that's a much wider street mm -hmm. um, in, than ours. And so I, I'm just wondering, like when, when you're, when, when you're, um, seeing combinations of things like concerns about sight line and concerns about um, the width of the street with a bump out like do, do you as a city offer us recommendations given all of these components together or, you know that, that you're like your top recommendation for the recommendation is as, as in like this this traffic calming 
guide or the, the, the design this, that this, we're proposing? An ultimate strategy. Oh, um, I mean, we're using on a case by case for these projects, we're using, you know, our judgment and design practices with them. The, uh, the markings, so with the, with the curb extensions, the, the markings as referring to you, like the, the, I think they will stick like the colored flags or like colored pieces, like plastic pipe. Um, so it's sticking out when, um, when maintenance is going through, but I mean, like things like maintenance, that's, Definitely don't want to install something that is just going to get eaten up and, and destroyed within, you know, a season or two. Um, but some of that may just be related to it being a new device and people are becoming more familiar with it. Um, but I mean, when we're considering what to install or um, where to install it, I mean, we're looking at design best practices. Um, we're looking at the city standards. We're using engineering judgment. So what what we present with this pro with these traffic calming projects specifically, what we present is what we feel is the best fit for, you know, what that preliminary study shows and what the concerns have been through, you know, the initial petition and the questionnaire. Um, but we, you know, we want to open it up to, to you, to the residents to, you know, to get your input if, if you know, if this is something that you want to live with, or if, if you feel like it would be um, better, a better fit for your, your, your street to have, you know, A over B. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, moving forward. And I've got one more question on here. Concerned with bump outs and sight lines for bicycles using our street. So what I'm presenting now are just descriptions of the things that are possible, that we see are possible um, for this project area, for, for Warden. So I have the actual starter idea in a couple slides. So I, I'm not dismissing your question. I still have it up here, but, um, but let me move forward and get the, get to the, actual starter idea for this plan and maybe we can talk more have a uh, different feedback there um so this just really quickly is a website for the traffic calming just general traffic calming program there is an interactive map you can go to to see other examples of the devices that have been installed where other projects have occurred um what projects are in progress uh, so that's there for you as as something to explore if, if um, instead of driving around through them. So, like I said, next I'll start. I'll present the starter idea. This is a draft plan that we've created. As I've said, this is based on the data collection, um, including that preliminary study, feedback from the initial questionnaire, feedback from that petition. Um, so this is what we see from an engineering standpoint would work to, mit, to meet what those concerns are. Um, there will be opportunity to answer questions on each of the devices, discuss changes you may want to see or concerns that you might have. Um, just keep in mind that this project is limited to the devices we just reviewed. And you know, there's still additional engineering and design that go into these. These are conceptual. Um, this is just kind of a, a launch pad for conversations. So as I had mentioned before, um, there was a, a, a question or there's, yeah, there's a question just earlier about how many bumps or tables we'd be looking at for the size of the street. So um, there is 
we have a general ballpark um, for how far apart we want to space these devices so that they're you know, effective in calming traffic and, and keeping the vehicles slow throughout the, the project area or throughout the block, um, but not so far apart that, or not so close that you're just consistently stop, go, stop, go, stop, go. So for the size of the street, we wanted to start with two devices, two speed humps, um, effectiveness, they're most effective when they're used in a series. So, you know, proposing just one single speed hump wouldn't do very much uh, for this size of, of roadway. Um, given the number of utilities that are in the street, uh, storm sewer, uh, manholes, sanitary manholes, uh, the fire hydrants. We do have to work around those. Um, one for clearance for, for proper clearance for emergency vehicles. Um, and two, we aren't able to install these things over over any of the manhole device over any of the devices like that. So we're also mindful of the driveways to make sure that there's you know enough clearance. A lot of a lot of times, a lot of these driveways are are staggered. Um, so yeah, this is the high level high high level photo, and then just zoom in a little bit. Um, so device number one, this is a speed hump near 2185 2186 Mershon uh, towards Jackson. As we said before, speed humps, they can result in speed reduction, traffic volume reduction, crash reduction. Um, parking is still permissible. Trash, uh, trash cans or recycling bins, those are allowed to be parked on here. Um, that height is designed for both vehicle and bicycle safety. The other device, uh, the other speed hump is towards the Dexter end. Um, same thing. Actually, it might be helpful to just keep it at the, the high level or aerial photo of the whole project area. If there's any, so now that you 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 have a chance to look at what we're proposing, let's see if if there's any feedback or questions about this, we'll open the floor. And Jason, go ahead and unmute. Hi, uh, this is, uh, yeah, Jason. Uh, I guess my two questions are, uh, number one, does the speed hump on the Dexter uh, side need to be um, Closer to Dexter, I guess that uh, on the Dexter side, it's it's an uphill climb at first, so maybe that's not uh, a place where speeding happens as much. But right around, I would say 125 or so, um, or just before 125, you crest right around there, and then you're, and so that's a it's a big blind spot between 125 and like 121, uh, mm -hmm. or and so I don't know if the if the uh, you know it's, it's pretty easy to to get a pretty fast speed going, and then suddenly come over the hump and and have a uh, speed bump sitting way sooner in front of you than you might think if you were speeding, uh, and for it to maybe not be effective uh, because it's not uh, prematurely slowing the the car down. Okay. I will say so having it um having it farther out so instead of being blindsided by it um which would likely you know slow you down but being able to see it and then having we, there is advanced signing that says you know this is a speed hump zone um but being able to see it should be an indicator that you need to slow down. Right. So what I'm saying is, is on the on the Jackson side, first off, 
there's not that many sort of houses. There's that 2000 uh, Jackson Place is, is just a long lawn and there's not much in the way of kids or other things there. So I think where the, I, I'm not, I'm speaking naively. So the, I may be completely off about this, but it seems, and it's a downhill going that way. So the speed bump is going to be visualized. It seemed pretty easily. And, and so it seems like an appropriate place to put it on the Dexter side. That speed bump is going to be a total surprise, especially if someone's speeding and not therefore probably paying attention to signage. Whereas if it was placed closer to 125 or just before 125, that's still at the crest of the uphill. It's going to be seen. And and so it'll create the warning, the visual warning early to slow down if it were there. Oh, sorry. I had it mixed up what you're saying. So you're saying it would be more visible if it's closer to 125. Exactly. It's not, okay. it's, it's completely un, it's completely not visible, uh, except with a very short, the crest of Warden is right about 125. I've, I'm not home right now, but I think, I think Markel or Jack or Brian would probably agree that it's probably around 125. And okay, okay. so it's not going to be, so instead the way it's designed right now, I'm imagining someone crests and if they're speeding, they've got literally 10 feet till they like to slam on their brakes be uh, before they hit the bump. Okay. I see what you mean. So maybe we can move it closer to, closer to Dexter. It looks like there is room. Like right about where that existing street light is is mm -hmm. is probably about where things crest and and the driveways over there are 125's driveway is on the um uh, uh is is on the sort of the left side of the map here and um and 127's driveway is on the right side of the map so like that would create a an area i think a permissive area yes i see um but so maybe we'll not. I, at, I wouldn't put it before the crest of the hill just because then you aren't you, you aren't putting it where you need it. Mm -hmm. um, but definitely can look at putting it closer to 123. It looks like there's adequate space and it looks like we're clear of utility. Um, <laughs> Does anyone else on the call hat know exactly where things crest? I just put my a message and I would agree with you, Jason. It, that's what I was talking about before that coming from that Dexter side, your your sight line is so limited. And if anybody's car is parked there, I feel like I'm like by by grace of God haven't gotten in an accident yet over there. Totally if, agree. Yeah. If people are whipping around. Um, it it feels like not being able to see that could create more of an obstruction. Okay. So I see, Markel, you also have your hand raised if you wanted to, if there's anything you wanted to add. Sure, thanks. And so I don't disagree with the uh, the cresting concern. I think my my question to you is, do we have data on which direction of traffic has more speeding violation? Um, is that northbound traffic or southbound traffic? Um, um it was. Go ahead. Oh, um, it was two-way traffic that was collected. So we do know that they're speeding on here. Um, the data I can dig to see if it was split into two-way, but I believe they might have just used uh two collectors and just okay. gotten two-way data. But yeah. we do know that the eighty-fifth percentile is is over twenty-five miles an hour. Yeah, the reason I'm asking is I have not done any counting, but I have the sense that the more speeding is in the northbound direction, but maybe this is just me hypothesizing. So meaning moving from Jackson to Dexter. And the reason I'm bringing this up is because if we pull that speed bump number two closer to the crest, closer to Dexter, for good reason, are we increasing that stretch between the two, which then allows its end, it's on a downhill, allows people to kind of pick up speed in the middle of the block there. So that's just a question I have, not being an expert um, about stretching the two speed bumps apart. 
Thank you. I don't know. What, what about three? What are, I guess I don't know if I'm still muted or not, but. No, I can hear you. You're okay, good. Sorry. I, I, I understand. Uh, Markel happens to be my wife, so <laughs> I, I, I agree with her. If if the most of the speeding is happening northbound, you don't want that second one too far away. Uh, so I guess that asks: Is it is three speed bumps too much for a for a block? Uh, yes, I would not put more than two devices here. Although put spacing it another hundred feet isn't going to you know, make, render these devices ineffective. Um, I would, I would say if we're seeing most speeding through the, oh, my pointer, if we're seeing, you know, if the concern, if there's a huge, uh, I would say speeding is most likely to occur where you have flat, um, flat unobstructed roadway. Um, so my my guess without having, you know, a, been able to observe is that there is speeding that, you know, pick up picks up here when you're if you're turning from a side street and coming up and down like up and down these hills, you're ready to pick up speed and once you get to this flat area here is where you're you're gonna see the 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 peak speed, uh, the most speeding occur. Um, I hear you on the I hear the the feedback on the concern of of visibility with you know coming from Dexter. It is definitely possible for us to to move this device over. Um, I wouldn't move it onto the the crest of the hill. Um, but we could definitely move it closer to like this, this area here, I believe was, was pretty clear. And like I said, that's not going to render the, the devices ineffective. I mean, we still, like I said, we're, we're thinking about, you know, how close are we putting these together? Um, are we putting them in, a, in an area where we're likely to see speeding? So If there is, it may, and it may just be that we need to go out there again and take a look at that, you know, kind of mentally mark where we're thinking about putting this device and um, do a site distance check there, which is definitely possible for us to do ahead of the next meeting. But I would not put three devices here. The, the, the length of the roadway is just not, is not long enough. Um, I do have a couple of questions that came in. One was, uh, the first one was, would there be a sign on the north intersection indicating a speed bump is ahead for people turning off of Dexter? Yes, so the, um, the speed humps do come with advanced signing. Um, it would likely be after you've turned off of Dexter, entering the roadway, it would um, they would not be placed, you know, outside of the intersection, but um, more likely, you know, as you're turning, you would see the sign. So for the next, um, you know, a next version of this, next iteration of this drawing, um, you know, we can go out in the field. We can look at how far we can move device number two closer to Dexter um, without compromising what we see as being effective spacing between the two devices. Um, I don't know if there's any any additional feedback or context that, or you know, maybe concerns with with doing that that anyone might have? This would be a good chance to to talk about it now because the next the next section is just um, polling on on the devices on approval of the devices. So if there's any other um, any other concern 
that we want to talk about. Go ahead, Jason. Oh, you'll have to unmute. Sorry. Now I can. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes. All right. So I had to step away for five minutes about half an hour ago. So it may, may have been discussed when I stepped away for five minutes. But uh, the reason uh, for sure to do speed bumps instead of the narrowing um, in this scenario or what would be the advantage instead of doing the narrowing? Oh, that's, that's strictly because choosing speed humps. Um, well, one, there was kind of, there was mixed reactions in the questionnaire. Uh, so some of the questions that were asked were, you know, have you had any positive experiences with traffic calming? Have you had any negative experiences? Um, it was it was mixed. You know, some people had issues with speed humps, although that was specifically how tall they can be. Um, but there were there was feedback on the curb extensions um, and their usefulness. Additionally, the the speed data that was collected, um, you know, the 85th percentile speed was almost 30 miles an hour. Uh, so we know that speed humps will have a more direct effect on on the speeding. Um, so that's why that was the- Oh, you mean the empirically speed humps slow traffic down better than narrowing? Is that what you're saying? I don't know if I'd use empirically, if, but in general, yes, the speed hump would be a more direct solution to speeding rather than the curb extension. Thank you. You're welcome. I just can't assign a specific number, um, even though there are studies that show like, you know, the effectiveness of traffic calming devices um, it's it's a generalization. I don't want to put any, you know, percentages on anything, especially when it's we're looking at one single block. Um, see, Brian, you've got your hand raised. You can go ahead and unmute. Thanks. I'm wondering if there'd be any opportunity um, to consider a bump out. Uh, particularly on Jackson, because we've got Jackson Place as well as Jackson. And I mm -hmm. cross grandkids there a lot. And having a bump out there from a pedestrian safety uh, makes a lot of sense to me, in addition to speed bumps. Maybe that's also true uh, at Dexter. Can you potentially combine uh, bump outs with speed humps as part of a strategy? Let me, so this map kind of cuts off Jackson just a little bit. Was there a specific area that you're looking at? Yeah, I'm looking at, um, it's the, it's kind of the crossing um, right at Jackson Place. Mm -hmm. So you've got, I don't know, 50, 60 feet um, after somebody turns on to, warden before um and it's kind of the, it is the intersection for crossing uh at jackson place there's no sidewalk on jackson ave on that side mm -hmm. yeah so kind of right where you've got got it right now okay could there be a potential fun. to put uh you know have a combination basically of a, a bump out at the one or more uh, of the intersections as well as speed humps uh on the street itself as a way to to uh, control traffic and provide more safety to pedestrians. Yeah, let me look at. So would it, um, so there's sidewalk here and sidewalk here, and there's a, a crosswalk crossing ward in here. So is that, would, yes. are you, okay, in this, yes. in this corner here, okay. Yep. I don't see any, so there's no, um, so there's no uh, catch basins over there. Um, we've got curb uh, and gutter. Definitely have to check to make sure that 
it wouldn't have an, you know, it, it definitely would have to check to make sure the extension, any kind of extension wouldn't impact um, drainage. But yeah, putting mm -hmm. a, a curb extension here, you know, it'll shorten the distance that you have to cross, uh, crossing ward in here. Um, and also bring you out a little, bring that crosswalk ramp out a little more. Um, we'll have to look at making sure we're maintaining enough width on Jackson Place, because that seems to be the more narrow of the two. Um, we'll just have to make sure that we have enough width for emergency vehicles to turn. Mm -hmm. um, but that's definitely something that we can meet. Sorry, I'm going to write this down a little bit. Um, make sure that we're looking at that. So this is the southeast, or no. I'm going to see the northeast quadrant. Okay. If there's any, I guess if there's any other feedback um, on that on that idea that anyone wants to add, Jacqueline, I see you have your hand raised. Uh, thanks. I I was just gonna piggyback off of that. That was a really good idea, Brian. Um, the that if if what Brian just said mm -hmm. were viable, it would it would offer it seem again like i'm i'm the opposite of an engineer so pardon me if this sounds ridiculous but um it would offer a solution to mark hell's concern about the straightaway because then that the the hump at 107 could could bump up and allow for the the hump at 121 to bump closer to the crest like it yeah, could I don't... it could shift everything just a hair Right. I don't know offhand how much we would um, move that first one. Uh -huh. But if it, yeah, definitely if it, um, you know, having a device there, we could then, uh, you know, scooch that first device up a little more. So I will correct what I said, said earlier about not having three devices. I would not have three speed humps, but mm -hmm. but this would be a viable solution. So it sounds like my task is to see whether or not a curb extension is possible at this corner of Jackson Place and Warden and if that's the case, um, shifting these two devices towards Dexter a little more mm -hmm. towards the north. Mm -hmm. I okay. think that looks great. Perfect. So I did get um, another comment in here. Any chance of adding a very short sidewalk along Warden between Jackson Place and Jackson Road? Or is that out of scope of the project? Unfortunately, it is. Um, it's, you know, it, unfortunately, we're not able to kind of add anything in that's outside of uh, what the program's guidelines are. Um, it's definitely something I can pass along to the sidewalks program. Uh, they are in charge of assessing new crosswalks, new crosswalk ramps. Um, so we can pass that message along to them and see if there's anything um, that from their pers perspective um, and if there's anything that residents themselves have to, to fill out, I will follow up. Um, while I'm remembering it, if you would like to have your email address, uh, if you would like me to have your email address to let you know when things are going out in the mail, um, or if there's any kind of follow-up you, you want, you can put your email in the Q&A, um, or I'll provide my contact information at the end and you can, you can let me know that way. But yes, a short sidewalk would have to go through the sidewalks program. Um, 
I can follow up with more information after this meeting on that. Was there anything was there anything else you wanted to add, Brian, on on that curb extension? No, no, I just appreciate uh, uh, the consideration and just taking a closer look at what might be possible. Okay, no, I appreciate. And like I said, like having having this opportunity for the feedback is is really important because we can look at it from our perspective from the engineering side. Mm -hmm. But I mean, the lived experience and just the day to day on the on Warden is more valuable. So mm -hmm. I have my homework for the next meeting. I have a couple slides for you for um, just general um, feedback on the devices. I will launch these. So keeping in mind, and I will add a poll, another poll question here in a minute about the, the curb extension, but keeping in mind the discussion that we've just had that, you know, we, we would potentially move this north a, a bit. If this is something that you support. Okay. All right, so we're unanimous. Um, great. That doesn't always happen, so that's great. <laughs> uh, let's see. And then again, same thing. Uh, device number two, also a speed hump, given that our goal is to move it farther north. Um, Regardless, if we put in a curb extension and move device one up, we can, we should be able to, I'll have to double check, but we, we should be able to move device number two, at least, you know, up a couple houses um, around 123. Okay. Same thing, cool. And then um, give me a minute because I am slow to type, but I will add another question. For that curve extension. And this one, I just gave it a yes or no. I, I saw that there's, um, we've got at least one person that may not identify with being part of the living on the project area, but can use that later. But this way, I, you know, we just have it a formal piece of data um, to show what we discussed. And again, that would be this corner here that we're talking about. Okay. So it looks like we're all on the same page with that as well, which is great. And so that's the end of that feedback exercise. Again, I really I really appreciate this dialogue. It's it like I said, this is it's super important to have, you know, engagement and participation coming from, you know, more than just one person, and especially more than just me, uh, to help make these, you know, build.
build our confidence in these plans and, and make them so they're something that, you know, you're happy that you're going to be living with it. Um, wrapping up, so over the next couple of weeks, uh, I'll post today's presentation and a recording of the presentation to the project website. Um, I'll also create a summary of today's uh, meeting. It'll have the polling results. Um, it'll have a couple pieces of information on there, um, specifically with the sidewalk program um, and maintenance of devices. And um, also, I will attempt to get a, a more solid answer on um, fire department concerns with, with devices. I think that was raised earlier. Um, we'll use the feedback. I have my homework. Um, we'll create a preliminary plan. So just another iteration of, of this. Uh, the next step will be meeting number two, which is going to consist of two parts. There's going to be a self-guided tour that you can do ahead of the meeting. And then that meeting will also be uh, on Zoom, it'll be on Zoom again. It's scheduled for May 29th. May, tw May 29th, is it? May I don't 29th? know if I unmuted successfully, but it's the postcard oh. says it's June uh, 5th. Yes, you're right, June 5th. I'm sorry, this is copy and pasted from an old, from the last presentation, like I said, I apologize. June 5th is our next meeting, thank you for the correction. Um, for the self-guided tour, you will receive a mailing packet um, at least two weeks ahead of, of the June 5th meeting. Um, the packet's going to have device images and descriptions similar to those um, earlier slides on you know, the toolkit. Um, those can be utilized to just walk through a warden and do a self-guided tour so you can see where uh, the devices would ideally be installed, what we're proposing them to be installed at. Um, you can do that prior to the meeting. We'll go out there, we'll uh, mark the device locations and spray paint on the pavement and we'll, you know, it'll also have a, a display on a temporary sign with the, the image and description near each of those locations. So. You'll be able to walk out in the street and see it. Um, if not, you can always use Google, Google Earth Street View or, or a map street view um, and conduct the self-guided tour that way. Oh, sorry, Jacqueline, you, your hand is raised. I don't know if I, I missed anything. I had a quick question. In your experience, is it best? Like we're we're a pretty short block, and we all, I mean, with with some obvious exceptions, um, not to name names, we all get along pretty well. So, like, is it your recommendation that we do the self guided tour? Is is a is groups or a group so that we can discuss it as we're going, and and then come to you at that meeting with having having stewed a little bit outside of our own eyes as a group? Um, I mean, yeah, I, th I think that would be a great idea just for you, you know, to look at them together. It's definitely not necessary. I've actually not had anyone um, give me that kind of feedback, whether or not they've, they've gone out there together. I think my impression was, my, my perception is that most of the, for most of these walkthroughs, people, you know, are just kind of like looking out their window and they see it, or maybe they like on their own, they've, they've walked past it and looked. but I, you know, I think going out as a group is a great idea. I am um, um, prior to these meetings being virtual. I think meeting two used to be hosted like on, on the street, maybe I'm not entirely sure, but um, it's, I don't think it's, it's necessary. It's, it's, I would encourage it just for the sake of community bonding and, and just having that, you know, sense, like collective sense of um, decision-making, um, but definitely come 
to the meeting, at least having, you know, looked at it. And if there are any, any questions, um, you know, people can reach out to me ahead of the meeting, during the meeting, after the meeting. Um, so June 5th, 6 p.m., um, it'll be a similar format to today, except for all of the introductory stuff. We'll kind of just get right to the point and pull the preliminary plan up on the screen. And that way we can just get right into any questions or um, any, any feedback that was, that came up after having done the self-guided portion. Um, we'll also do polling on the devices, similar to the one we just did, the activity we just did. And then the last step of the traffic calming process is uh, final polling. So after meeting two, you know, we'll have a chance to discuss things. If there are any, typically there aren't any changes at that point, um, or that there hopefully aren't any, but if there are, we'll make sure that you know, there's a consensus at the meeting of what they'll be, um, because the next thing that you'll receive is uh, a, the final plan. So you'll get that mailed to you. Um, the package will have a cover letter, a copy of the final plan, and the final polling uh, card or polling sheet. So just like that initial questionnaire that we sent out a um, couple months back, you'll have the option to fill out the poll uh, online or just mail it in. You can do it either, either way. Um, for it to move forward though, um, more than 50% support is required. Um, if that is met, if that requirement is met, our team will request support from the Transportation Commission um, and then we'll submit it to City Council for approval. If it's approved by City Council, they will set a construct, well, a construction date will be determined. Um, just another note on the, the minimum response requirement. Um, that is based on of the people who participate in the poll. So of the people who turn in a final poll card, more than 50% have to uh, support it. So, if, you know, if I only get 10 responses and it's five yes, five no, the final plan doesn't move forward. It has to be more than 50%. And then this is just a summary of what our next steps will look like. So, Again, the presentation or recording, it'll be posted to the project website in the next week or two. Um, additionally, there'll be a summary of the polling. We'll use all of this information to create our preliminary plan. Um, the preliminary plan is scheduled for June 5th. A couple weeks ahead of that, uh, we'll be out there to mark those device locations um, in the street. That way you kind of get a sense of how much space they take up and where they're uh, going to be. We'll have our, our meeting, we'll get feedback. Um, after that, we'll finalize the plan. It'll be mailed uh, to, to everyone by June 26th, June 26th or earlier. Um, you'll have until July 29th, so you'll have nearly a month to complete that, uh, to submit that final poll. Um, The requirement to remove to move forward is that of those who participate in the poll, more than 50% have to approve of the final plan. And um, that will be approval as in its entirety. So, you know, today we do today or at the meetings, we do like a, a device by device polling question. This will just be as a whole, do you support this plan as is? So it won't be um, picking out devices. It'll be as is. Um, if the requirement is met, we'll go to the Transportation Commission or Transportation Committee uh, and City Council for their approvals. Tentatively, 
August, September is where we're looking. September is where we're looking to wrap things up. Um, I don't have firm dates right now just because sometimes things aren't able to get on the agenda in time. Um, meeting dates change, but ballpark, we're looking at September being able to wrap this up. But um, we have a couple minutes left of our scheduled time. I will do two quick things. I'm going to launch a demographic survey. This is something that the city uses just in all of their public engagement. It's anonymous. If you have a, a couple minutes before heading out to fill it at, um, to complete the survey, I would appreciate that. But more importantly, my contact information is on the screen. Um, if you have any additional comments or questions or anything that comes up after today, maybe after you've sat for a minute with, with what we've discussed, uh, please reach out. You can call and leave me a message and I'll get back to you. You can email me. Um, I've got a couple emails that came in, so I'll make sure you're added to the email list, which um, basically notifies you that a mailing has gone out. Um, please, one last thing, take note of the Wade Trim logo. Uh, I send mailing packages from our office. So that way anything that's returned comes back to me directly. Um, I, I don't have envelopes yet that have both the city logo and the Wade Trim logo on them. Um, maybe one day I will. I know that I know the, the, the city's logo is much more recognizable. I just, I do my best to make sure that these mailings don't get missed, but you know, please just be on the lookout for them and know that that we'll be sending mail um, over the next couple months. Um, I guess like I'll end the meeting at, at 7.30, but if there are any questions or any other, any comments or things that people might have, um, feel free. Otherwise, I appreciate your time. I really appreciate the dialogue and the, the feedback. This has been very, very helpful. Um, I hope you have a great night. And I, you know, again, I really appreciate your, your interest and your care in this project. So I look forward to our next meeting. But other than that, I will uh, see you all uh, in June. Thank you, Christy. Have a good night.